Okay, everybody, these are going to be the class notes on physical states and solubility rules. There's a lot to this. Um, we're not trying to make it difficult. We're just trying to break it down and make it a little bit easier for you. Um, it's not going to be an incredibly crucial piece um, just for chem one's sake, but if you really want an understanding of chemistry and you want to go on in chemical fields, biology, medicine, things like that, these are going to become really important. And if you can get them now, it'll make all of your future classes in science a lot easier. So here are some class notes on physical states and solubility. Now, first off, I just want to have some tips. You don't necessarily need to write them, but just some things that I think you definitely should be aware of. Every time you're given a prompt, like if I tell you to translate a sentence into a chemical equation, sometimes that prompt has clues. Like it will say, um, salt that has been dissolved, which that should signal to you in your brain that it is aqueous, okay? So read the prompt. Sometimes the physical states are literally given to you and you don't have to worry about figuring them out. The second thing is only use the periodic table for elements, not for compounds. I see people all the time who take, let me just scoot this up here. They take something like NaCl, and they try to put solid for the sodium and gas for the chlorine, okay? Because if you look at the periodic table, our periodic table is color-coded, right? So anything with a black symbol is going to be a solid at room temperature. Anything with a blue symbol, which is, uh, there's only two of them, are gonna be liquids at room temperature and anything with a red symbol is a gas at room temperature, okay? But this is only when it's in its pure form. Chlorine is not a gas when it's part of a compound. It's only a gas when it's pure chlorine. So don't do this. Don't do this. This is trying to give a single substance two different physical states. And that is not what we want. Okay. Let me just adjust this here for a second. Okay. So just use the periodic table for elements, not for compounds, okay? And then acids are all gonna be aqueous for the purposes of our class. There are some acids that are, that could be maybe in a solid form, like ascorbic acid is vitamin C, for example. But the acids that we're gonna be using in our chemical reactions are going to be aqueous. So if you see an acid, you could just write aqueous. Now, what I wanna do for the notes is to go through each type of chemical reaction and, talk about a way to dissect that type of reaction in order to figure, figure out the physical states. So you do need to know your types of chemical reactions so make sure you get those down, okay? So first, I wanna start with our combination, which I will be calling synthesis, okay? Remember, you've got, for a combination synthesis, you're gonna see like element A plus element B creating compound of A and B. So some kind of compound with A and B put together, okay? These two are really straightforward. If it's an element, you look at the periodic table. You look at the periodic table and find its physical state. That's it, period, okay? The compound is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but in a single, or sorry, in a synthesis reaction, it is most likely a solid. If we're synthesizing something, it is most likely a solid, okay? So if there's only one substance on that side of the arrow, it's almost always going to be solid. Now, I already told you acids are aqueous. So if you see an acid, it's probably not. Or if you see something that you recognize like water or carbon dioxide, those ones I just hope you would already know, water is liquid, carbon dioxide is a gas, um, if it's part of a synthesis reaction, okay? But most likely a solid. When you only have a single compound by itself on one side of the arrow, and doesn't matter which side, it's most likely gonna be a solid. So Exceptions are gonna be things that you recognize. So likewise, decomposition, remember these are opposites of each other. A decomposition reaction is going to be a compound 
of, I'm gonna switch it up, of C and D. So pretend elements, remember that's not carbon, it's just compound C and D is gonna break up into element C and element D, okay? Element C plus element D. Again, these, we're going to use the periodic table. Use the periodic table. This one, same as this. It is most likely a solid. When you have a substance by itself on that side of the arrow, whether it's before the arrow or after the arrow, it doesn't matter. A single substance by itself is almost always going to be a solid. So most likely solid. And again, I'm gonna just kind of attach these two and put a little star here and say, whoops, <laughs> and say, whoops. Um, if you have a compound by itself before the arrow, so lonely, lonely compounds, Lonely compounds are likely solid. Lonely compounds are likely solid. Again, there's always gonna be exceptions. So we're just trying to give you like a general clue as to how to figure out physical states in our chemical reactions, okay? Now I'm gonna go on to single replacements and double replacements. All right, so single replacements. Remember on a single replacement, you have an element. I'm gonna say an element um, A plus compound BX. Okay, element A replaces element B here. So we get element B. plus compound AX, okay? So I abbreviated there on the other side so I could fit it all on one line. But here again, what are we gonna do for our elements, okay? If you only have an element, if an element is by itself, not part of a compound, use the periodic table, okay? Use the periodic table. So those two are simple. You look them up on the periodic table, okay? For our single replacements, our compounds will be aqueous. So single replacement compounds are aqueous, are aqueous, okay, they're dissolved in water. Um, there are occasional exceptions and the most common exception here I'm just gonna say, except metal oxides. Metal oxides are solid, okay? So single replacement compounds are gonna be aqueous, except for metal oxides, which are solid. Metal oxides are solid, okay? So any metal, there's a lot of them to choose from, any of these metals, okay? combined with oxygen. So if you have silver oxide, iron oxide, magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, any metal oxide is going to be a solid, okay? All right, I think I can fit double replacements on here. Okay, double replacements. We've got compound, I'm gonna abbreviate again. We've got compound AX plus compound BY. They trade partners, we end up with um, compound AY plus compound BX. Okay, trading partners. Remember with our double replacement reactions, everything before the arrow is aqueous. Everything before the arrow is aqueous, okay? So both aqueous before the arrow. 
Anything before the arrow? After the arrow, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, okay? One compound will be aqueous. One compound will be aqueous, but not both. If both of them are aqueous, there really wasn't a reaction. So if both of these are soluble, it's not really a reaction. Nothing happened. Everything stays dissolved, okay? But one compound will be aqueous. Then if you remember back in 11.2 when we did those class notes, there's three different possibilities for that other compound, okay? So one will be, if it is ionic, it will be solid, okay, a precipitate, right? We talked about that. This is where we get the precipitate, okay? If it is covalent, it could be a liquid or a gas. And for our class, if you notice it's covalent, you, you know, pick one. It'll probably be water, which will hopefully ring a bell in your head that that's uh, liquid, okay? But some other things like H2S sometimes comes out of a double replacement, that would be a gas. It just depends on the situation, okay? So we're looking for the other compound to be either a solid, liquid, or gas. If it's ionic, it's gonna be that precipitate. If it's covalent, it's gonna be a liquid or a gas. But how do you figure out which one's aqueous and which one is the solid, for example? Well, that's going to come in the solubility rules at the bottom of the page. So just hang in there. I will teach you how to figure that one out, okay? But you're always going to have one compound that's aqueous. So sometimes the book tells you which compound is aqueous. Then you automatically know that that other one that's ionic is a solid, okay? Um, or if you see water on that side of the arrow and you know water is a liquid, then the other compound is automatically aqueous. So Double replacement has a lot of aqueous going on, but it wouldn't be a reaction if they were all four aqueous. So we have to figure out which one of the products is no longer aqueous. Okay, before we get into the solubility rules, I wanna talk about combustion reactions. Okay, so in a combustion reaction, remember, we're gonna rewrite that generic formula for a combustion reaction. It's a hydrocarbon fuel remember that means made out of hydrogen and carbon hence the word hydrocarbon okay plus o2 gives you co2 plus h2o okay so that's our classic hydrocarbon combustion okay all three of these are gases we don't normally think of water as a gas. If you label it as a liquid, I'll be nice. I won't, I won't care too much, okay? But in a combustion reaction, the water comes out as a gas because of the high temperature nature of the reaction. So all three of those are gases. Now the fuel could be any physical state, okay? Not aqueous, but this is gonna be either solid, liquid, or gas. Okay, and that is gonna be based on the number of carbon atoms. Based on the number of carbon atoms and whether it has other elements or not. Okay, so let me just give you a quick range here. If we have less than four, less than four carbons, okay, this is gonna be a gas. If it's a pure hydrocarbon, no other elements, okay? If we have four to 12 carbon atoms, it's gonna be liquid. And if we have greater than 12 carbon atoms, it's going to be solid, okay? So less than four is a gas, four to 12 is a liquid, over 12 is a solid, okay? But we have to always talk about like exceptions. If other elements, if other elements are in the fuel, 
If other elements are in the fuel, for example, oxygen, it will move it towards the solid end of the scale. It will move towards the solid end. So for example, if I have C2H6, okay? Let me write that out so you can see it. You don't necessarily need to write it, but C2H6, that's a hydrocarbon, okay? Two carbons is less than four. This is a gas, it's called ethane, okay? But if I add an oxygen to this, C2H5OH, it still only has two carbons, which makes us want to say gas, but this one is a liquid, okay? So when you add another element into the mix, it pushes it down the scale. I don't expect you to memorize which ones are gonna be liquid, solids, et cetera. If you see two carbons and you label it a gas, I won't count off for that. But if you notice the oxygen and you label it a liquid, that would be excellent because that's gonna make that molecule more polar. So reaching back to our chapter eight, more polar means more attracted to each other, which is gonna push its physical state towards the solid end of the spectrum, okay? So there are some nuances trying to figure out what physical state they are when you throw oxygen in there, but that will be why if you label something a gas and it's not a gas when you look at the answer key, those are gonna be some of the reasons why. But again, if you base it totally on the number of carbons, I will not count you wrong, okay? Okay, last piece of the notes. I know these are long ones, I'm sorry. But we're gonna learn the solubility rules and this is gonna be really important for our um, double replacement lab coming up. So compound type solubility exceptions. This is, this is a solubility chart that you can use in any science class moving forward. There are several compound types. This table, there's a similar one in your book, but um, it is missing a few things. So here we go. We've got any compound of, let's see, I'm gonna put salts of alkali metals. Salts of alkali metals and ammonium. Salts of alkali metals and ammonium. Okay. Now, if you don't remember what those two things are, this isn't gonna help you very much. So let's switch colors here. Ammonium, if you can remember from our polyatomics, it's NH4 with a one plus charge. Okay, so if you see NH4 in a compound, that's gonna be one of these types of compounds. And then if we remember alkali metals are, are group one. So group one, we. That says group one, it really doesn't, but I'm gonna maybe put it in purple because my purple marker is much skinnier. So group one, group one, okay? Anything from group one. So if we look at this, remember hydrogen's in group one, but it's not a metal, so it's not an alkali metal. So lithium down to francium, those are the alkali metals. And ammonium is another plus one cation, okay? Their solubility, oop, let me switch back to purple. Soluble, okay? All of those are soluble. So if you have a compound that starts with an alkali metal, for example, sodium chloride, okay? It will dissolve in water or potassium iodide or ammonium nitrate, okay? Any compound that starts with a group one element or ammonium is gonna be soluble. And that means that you're gonna put a Q next to it in a single replacement, a double replacement, et cetera, okay? Um, it's going to be soluble. Now, NaCl, for example, is soluble. In a single replacement, in a double replacement, it will be aqueous. But if it's in a synthesis reaction, remember it's by itself after the arrow, that's gonna make it solid. We know salt can be solid or it can be dissolved. So synthesis, decomposition, when you have a compound by itself, it's probably solid. But in a single and a double replacement, that's where we get this aqueous, okay? Those are the most common places to see aqueous as a, as a physical state. Exceptions to this solubility rule, there are some lithium compounds, 
some lithium compounds that are not soluble, but we're not going to see any of those in this class. So for this class, this is like the number one rule to memorize is if it is an alkali metal or ammonium, if it has one of those in it, it's going to be soluble. It's going to be aqueous. Okay, second one, nitrate and chlorate. Oh, I'm spelling chlorate wrong. Don't forget that H. Remember nitrate is NO3, one minus, NO3, one minus. Chlorate is ClO3 with a one minus, okay? So nitrate, chlorate, they're soluble which means they're aqueous in a single replacement or a double replacement reaction. Exceptions, few, okay? So again, any compound that ends with NO3, soluble, lead nitrate, copper nitrate, calcium nitrate, okay? Anything that ends in chlorate, soluble, okay? So those single replacement, double replacement compounds are gonna be aqueous. Next one, sulfate. Sulfate is SO4, two minus, SO4, two minus. Sulfate is soluble. Again, if it's soluble, that means it's gonna be AQ in parentheses, following that substance in a chemical reaction for a single or a double replacement. And exceptions. Now this one has exceptions. Okay, so far we haven't really had any exceptions, but this one has exceptions, okay? I'm gonna list some elements. PB, AG, HG, BA, SR, and CA, okay? What this means is that if I have sulfate combined with one of these six cations, it will not be soluble. And if it's not soluble, what physical state will it be? Hopefully you're telling your computer solid, okay? So if you see lead, a lead sulfate, silver sulfate, mercury sulfate, barium sulfate, strontium sulfate, calcium sulfate, those are solid. Just those six exceptions. I'm not expecting you to memorize these. This one up here and this one right here, if you memorize those two, you're gonna be set for the purposes of our class. But those are the exceptions for sulfates. Next one, chloride and iodide. Chloride and iodide, okay? In the book, they just say chloride, but really we could probably put all of the halogens here, okay? So anything that ends with a halogen is gonna be soluble, which means aqueous, but there are exceptions for this one too, okay? Only three exceptions, silver, mercury, lead. Silver, mercury, and lead. Those three are not soluble, which means they would be solid if they formed in a reaction. Okay, and then our last piece of this solubility rules table is kind of long. We have carbonates. Carbonates. Phosphates. Chromates. Sulfides. and hydroxides, okay? Carbonates, phosphates, chromates, sulfates, so sorry, sulfides and hydroxides. So carbonate, remember, is CO3. It has a two minus charge, squeezing that in there. It says two minus. Phosphate is PO4, three minus. Chromate, is CrO4 two minus, if you wanna remind yourself. Sulfide IDE means it's just sulfur, 
with the two minus charge, okay? And hydroxide we all know is OH1 minus. These ones are not soluble. Not soluble, otherwise known as insoluble, and they will be solid compounds, okay? Now exceptions, I can't break the first rule with the last rule. So the exceptions here are alkali metals and ammonium. Alkali metals and ammonium, those ones will be aqueous even with this list of anions that likes to be solid, okay? So that's the solubility rules. That's the physical state rules. You're gonna to have to use these to label some physical states and some of our activities coming up. Um, so just make sure that you read through them. If you don't understand them, please come talk to a teacher. Please email a teacher. Please, please let us know. We can't teach you if you don't tell us that you need help, okay? So it was really nice to uh, give you these notes. <laughs> Hopefully you're not hating this right now and we will see you in class.